welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I thank you so much for joining us here on the program. And I will remind you, as I do on every program, that we're here Sundays at 7 a.m., 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com. Podcasts are on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, other locations you folks are reposting our sites to, our uh, uh, podcasts to. We're also on YouTube so that you can watch these interviews if you'd like and uh, get to see our guests uh, face-to-face, as it were. We also hope that you will go to our guest's website, which we will give, be giving you shortly so that you can continue your evolutionary process. And uh, we also ask that if you can support us financially, we have PayPal and Patreon accounts for your security as well as ours. And we ask you to participate in the decade of perfect vision, the 2020s. The decade of perfect vision encourages you to go within, to seek out that still small voice and find that calm, peaceful place where you can recenter, rejuvenate, revitalize yourself, get the kind of guidance that only you can get for yourself. Nobody can give it to you. You already have all of the guidance you could possibly ever want. And there is no such thing as, if I may use the phrase, hopefully for the very last time, no fake news in the still small voice. I guarantee you it will not put you in harm's way, but it might challenge you. I know this because I've been following my still small voice for some time. And I have to tell you some of the uh, directions that it asked me to go, I will question. And then I will follow through just because at the end of the day, wow, if I hadn't have done that, oh my gosh, things would have turned out even worse than I thought they ever could. So please do that. Our program today is going to focus, in a manner of speaking, on children. It's also going to speak, we're going to talk about dreams. We're also going to talk about our future. We're going to talk about the future of us. And it is what the dreams of children mean for 21st century well, we're going to focus on America, but hopefully we can expand that a little bit with our guest and his name. He's the author of the book. His name is Erwin Rylander and uh, Redliner. I thank you for joining us on the program. It's a pleasure to have you on the program here on the Zoom, on YouTube, and all of the other locations I've mentioned. Happy to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. You know, um, I'm hoping that you you don't focus too much on that old cliche. Our children are our, our future. future. It makes uh, yeah. me nauseous. Me too. Our children are children. Why can't they just be children while they're while they are young? I mean, I got to be a kid. I didn't have to grow up all that fast. I grew up in in uh, a rural, uh, urban uh, Phoenix, Arizona in the 60s and 70s. Had a great life. It wasn't quite Norman Rockwell, but then whose is other than Norman Rockwell's? Um, Maybe, but, yeah. Yeah. So t- give, us, give us an idea of of this, this aspect without using that cliche. And I, you know, and I realize that it's more than a cliche because it is true to an extent. Okay, I, I, I get what it means. But why are children the focal point of this concept of the future of us? Yeah, so, and I don't use that phrase either. It's become so cliched, it, it is, it's actually troublesome because people give it lip service and they don't really, it doesn't really mean anything from a functional point of view. But so let me uh, just uh, say a couple of words about why this book was written in the first place. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a pediatrician by background and I've spent my entire career starting in 1971 working with extremely uh, impoverished children who are facing all kinds of adversities. My first job was the med- as was the medical director of a of a clinic in the sixth poorest county of uh, in the U.S. at that point, which was Lee County, Arkansas, where I spent two years uh, dealing with kids who had literally nothing, who lived in absolute poverty, whose families really never and rarely got more than ten miles away from where they were living, and so on. So it was a very difficult environment. A lot of uh, Racial, racial turmoil and uh, obviously deep-seated poverty. 
And the rest of my career has, except for my forays into the disaster prevention and response world, which I've been doing simultaneously since the since 9-11, <clears throat> along with access to care for children, has been about talking to children, understanding what they're about and what their futures meant, not for us so much as starting off with, but for themselves. And the book starts off with, I think, a couple of uh, few, actually, uh, I think fairly compelling real stories of children that I was taking care of, including, let me, if I can, Richard, just let me just mention uh, mm -hmm. this kid, William, who I met on one of the mobile clinics that we um, developed for the Children's Health Fund. And I was the pediatrician, this was in the 90s, and I was uh, at a, a foster care site for children who had been homeless, and now we're in foster care. And I go into the back examining room of uh, our mobile clinic, and I see this bedraggled young man looking down, African-American kid, very sweet, but you know, not really engaging until I said to him, so William, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he looks up at me and I, I almost fell over, but he said, I, I would like to be a paleontologist. So this is a 10 year old child in the most unlikely circumstances to have even come up with that idea. And I said, where'd you get, what is that? He said, it's somebody who uh, studies dinosaurs and looks for dinosaur bones. So well, how do you know about that? And he reaches into his pocket, pulls out a yellowed clipping from uh, a two year old article in the New York Times about a famous paleontologist who was digging for dinosaur bones out west someplace. And I thought, well, I'm looking at this kid, profound poverty, living in a homeless shelter, not connected to his family, not going to school regularly. And it occurred to me that the chance of this child fulfilling that dream of being a paleontologist were almost non-existent. The chance he'd have to overcome so many adversities to get where he wanted to go, I was thinking to myself, how, what a, what a horrible situation for a child to have a dream that is actually unfulfillable, say compared to my children or the kids that uh, are the, you know, or belong to families that I was in my peer group. In fact, I had a friend uh, who runs an organization called Share Our Strength, Billy Shore. And I told him about this kid and he said to me, um, you know, my son is also 10 wants to be a paleontologist. So my wife got him a bookshelf full of, you know, reading about the dinosaurs and paleontology. And we flew him out west to meet with that very paleontologist was featured in the Times article. So this kid, William, on my mobile clinic in 1991, had nothing resembling that amount of support and no pathway whatsoever to getting where he wanted to go. Mm. So there's a number of stories like that. And the point being there that this is a shame for these children. How could this be in America that we'd have so many barriers to a child fulfilling his dreams or her dreams or aspirations? This can't be, this can't stand like this. And from there comes the sentiment that if we have millions of children who are deterred from their dreams by adversities that are not under their control, it's also not good for our country. We cannot afford in this day and age to not being able to have all hands on deck. There's too many problems and challenges. We need every kid to be able to fulfill their destiny, which is what really drove me to this book. So it's a combination of my, my heartfelt shock at really absorbing the fact that we have too many kids who can't do it, and that's terrible for them and their families but also thinking about what's the world like for America 20 years from now. And it's also like you pointed out, this is a global issue. We have hundreds of millions of children around the planet living in terrible circumstances for whom the future, for whom the future is very, very dim. And that's just not right. That's what drove the book and really my life's mission as well. Well, <clears throat> what you're talking about is part of what this program is all about. Giving people choices and knowledge of those choices to help make their dreams come true. Now, granted, it's focused primarily at adults, but it applies to everybody, children as well. And when I used that phrase and I thought about it and thought about it, I said, should I keep that? Because I'm not sure. Well, what the heck? I can explain it. I, 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 yeah, it's no problem. I can explain what that means. Giving people choices. Well, 
it's uh, I use the analogy of an individual a young person could be a child grows up uh, in this community where the only way that you are able to get to um, whether it's the school, the market, maybe the next town over uh, that's not that far away where you can get the things you need and then go back home again is um, you have to walk along the road and you have to follow the white shoulder, the line on the roadway because the fog is so dense that you can't see in front of you. But mm. because of the community's history, they know that if you just follow this white line and you wait for this, uh, you, this sign on the ground, boom, you're, you're in that town and you do what you need to and then come home. One day, we'll use the child, he's walking along following that white line and suddenly the fog lifts and he sees a fork in the road. Mm. And he's going, oh, ne we've never seen that before. Didn't even know it was there. I wonder what's down there. Now he has, he, she has a choice, an actual choice. Do I stay with the familiar, the comfortable, the white line along the side of the road until I get to the town to do my thing? Or, or do I explore? Do I have an adventure? Mm -hmm. And now it's up to them, what, you know, because before there was no choice. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about is absolutely so vital. And I have to tell you that when <clears throat> uh, a year ago, when uh, we all started hearing about this virus, um, and then in January and February, they made decisions that ostensibly shut the country down. I have to tell you, I was thrilled. I was elated. I was excited. You could not have, uh, you, you would have had to scrape me off the walls or the ceiling. I was so thrilled because I'm 60 years of age. I've been through a number of uh, years when the flu sweeps across this great land of ours, debilitating people for a week to 10 days. Uh, sometimes they go to school and or work and they spread it around and that goes on for weeks. Then we got the vaccines, the flu shot. People yep. take it, they would still get sick, but we still didn't do anything different other than get a, get a shot. Right. And this time we did something different. And it spoke to Einstein's comment, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result this time. We made a different choice. Doesn't matter the reasons why, but I knew the reason I was elated was two reasons. Number one was when we get to the other end of this, whenever and wherever it is, it's going to be different. We may not like it. It may, it definitely won't feel comfortable at first, but it's going to be different. It's going to be something new. The other thing was with the shutdown, what incredible opportunities are waiting for us that we don't even know exist. Yeah. And look at how people have responded in many cases, not all, but many, to what we, not just nationally, but globally, have been facing. Correct. So I was, like I said, I was thrilled. Um, I'm saddened, of course, by the three to 500,000 human beings we've lost in this country and God knows how many globally um, and primarily in this country, I believe, because people d can't handle the one constant in the universe and that's change. But that's kind of what you're talking about now. It is. It work, is. Is changing the way that we think. And of course, new paradigms for a new world. We've got to come up with some new paradigms yeah. that we've never tried before, but at the same time that a lot of people who are vested in the old paradigms say, no, 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 that'll never work. No, no, no. We can't have another different, we can't have a different economic system, a different political system, a different uh, inst uh, educational system, a different financial system, a different whatever institution you want to name. No, no, no. We got we to gotta re reinvigorate the old system because that's all we know. And it's like, that is not all we know. It's not all we know, and it's not all we could think of either. And it's like, you know, we crises call for innovation and exploration, exploration of new opportunities to look at the world differently, to address our problems differently. 
And, uh, and those, we basically, what we're doing, of course, is uh, to carry your analogy for, we're creating options. We're creating maybe multiple forks in the road where people have an opportunity to make those decisions. So the troubling thing that I was concerned about is that there are no options for a lot of people in our society. And, and unfortunately for a lot of children also, they just don't have the options that are mm -hmm. so vital uh, to a society that's growing, that's exciting, that's innovating. But if we restrict people's options, and again, children as well as adults, then we've restricted the opportunities to, to become better than we are in the years to come. And that's, that's just terrible. And besides, we have so many complicated problems that we never knew about when you and I were in our childhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like who's going to who's going to address those? Who's fixing those? Yeah. And if we don't have flexibility in our minds and the ability to process things differently with options, whether it's on an individual basis or on a larger societal basis, we are just asking for trouble uh, that manifests itself in many ways. One of which is that we won't be able to actually address effectively the problems that we have to face, whether it's climate issues or racism, whatever it is that we feel like we need to address, mm -hmm. we've got to be able to think, to use the cliche, another cliche, I, I can't say, but outside the, the box. <laughs> what boxes? Are you well, it doesn't matter. I think the yeah. point is that we, we have to be released from being imprisoned in a certain way of doing things. Uh, that's just not good. And what's tragic is, like I've been saying, Richard, is when you, you say to a child, you know, you're poor, you're black, you're in foster situation, your life is done. Yeah, you're 10 years old, but your options are, we know for a fact, are gonna be constricted uh, for as many decades as you're on the planet. What a horrible message for any child to have to, whether we say it outright or whether it's obvious, that's not okay for, for a country like the United States. We have too much going for us, we have too much wealth, we have too much opportunity. We have such a great history of innovation and, and leading. Uh, we can't be saying to any child, yeah, you know, you're, you're locked in to this destiny, uh, which is unsatisfying to you and also a problem for us. Because as you get older, we don't want to be doing remediation or incarceration. We want you going to graduate school. Yeah. So that's where this book is, is focused. And certainly uh, one of the things that, that I have noticed over my short 60 years on the planet uh, has been uh, the difference between the, the levels of solution or problem solving and the levels of complaining, whining, moaning, groaning about the way things are. Um, you know, I, I think about this uh, quite, quite a bit. We have not been using petroleum products, whether it be to uh, move our vehicles to and from or the various uh, products that we buy, wear, uh, sleep in, uh, live in, et cetera, et cetera. We did something before that, before we started burning uh, fossil fuels. Uh, we had other fuels before oil was discovered. Hmm. And I'm hearing so many people complaining about how, oh, no, you like I live here in California. And of course, the big thing is, is that uh, we want to be off of fossil fuels as far as mo uh, moving our vehicles around. Probably they, they're planning like 2030, 2040, what have you. And I'm sitting here going, and what's the problem with that? We are a creative people as human beings, not just Americans, but as human beings. Sure. We came up with... Uh, harnessing horses to draw carriages with wheels on them uh, to get from one place to another a little quicker. Uh, and then, of course, they did develop the automobile with, uh, that burned uh, fossil fuels. And now we're coming up with electric cars. As a matter of fact, yeah, I yeah. even saw an article where the, uh, they're working on the first, I think it's fusion, if not fission, engine, which blew me away. I'm going, really? Fusion, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I just hope it's not the, the 22nd century's version of the Ford Pinto. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I remember that well. It's funny yes. you bring that up. Yeah. So um, it's like, 
I remember when they first started bringing out the stuff on solar energy back in the seventies. And that's when I remember it. And I said, well, why don't we pursue it? And I kept hearing, well, it's, it's just, it's just too expensive. And my first thought, and again, I'm a teenager in the 70s. I'm just thinking, well, wait a minute. The longer we wait, the more expensive it's going to get. Yes. So as the old oil commercial, the old uh, um, change the oil in your vehicle commercial says, you can pay me now or you can pay, pay me, later. me later. Yeah. You know, and so let's talk about. We don't need to talk about the problems. And I'm a, I couldn't agree with you more. And by the way, when we talk about education, we're not just talking about formal education. Of course. Um, I was watching a video of a gal who I've had on this program. Uh, her name is Sky Taylor. She's in Ireland and she's a beekeeper. And the video was of, uh, I don't look like seven or eight or 10 homeschooled children who were standing around a boxed beehive and she was teaching them about the bees, about the products, about how they pollinate, about all of the different aspects. She was giving them a practical education. Yeah, sure. About the bees. Yes. And of course, uh, we're going to have her on the program talking about, for example, sacred geometry, uh, a, a sustainable living and, and those types of things. And so when I think about formal education, uh, Irwin, I think about how they talk about how we got to cut the budget. You know, we just don't have enough money. So we're going to have to cut the budget. We're going to have to drop this elective, that elective. I'm saying cut the basics. All right. Just take a look at the music course, whether it's uh, vocal music or instrumental music. Uh, you can learn about chemistry in terms of how the wind instruments or the brass instruments were made and then how they were formed to make the sounds that they make which requires not only geometry it also requires other sciences you're also going to learn about math because you have to learn about eighth notes 16th notes quarter notes half notes you're going to learn about poetry because vocal uh, 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 music with lyrics is nothing more than poetry in many cases poetry put to song or stories Learn sure. how to write a story and put it to song. So if you don't think that you're going to get the basics in those quote unquote elective courses, you're mistaken, but it will take a, an instructor, a teacher, an educator, a facilitator, a school, a school who that knows how, and then you have an instrument in the children's hands that gives them a practical application for all of these I, I couldn't agree more with you. This is actually, this, this is such reality-based lessons that you're sharing. And I, I think if you think about it, we'd have much more successful and much more engaged students if we did it the way you just described. Uh, I, as you were talking about it, I'm thinking of my own grandchildren and who are in traditional schools for the most part. And, you know, how much more exciting could you accomplish teaching those skills and those concepts in a way that would be so engaging. Uh, so here's a piece of music. So I, I've been, you know, pals with Paul Simon for many years, who's one of the ultimate poets, songwriters. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if you look at his lyrics uh, as standalone, it, they're, it's, it's beautiful. They are pure poetry and his music is creative. And he, how he works on, uh, you know, organize the, the, the mechanics of the musical signatures is, is just remarkable, but it encompasses everything you're talking about. And, um, you know, I, so listen, I, I think you're onto something and I, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to talk about that in my own please, world. Please. Do I have to credit you? You can credit me. I'll you don't have to credit, credit me, you, whatever you want to do. Just yeah. my, my goal isn't to take credit. I could have named this no. radio program, this podcast, this video cast, the Richard Dugan show. I didn't because uh, it's not just about me. Obviously yeah. it's a little because I'm sharing obviously from my experiences. It's about the ideas you and me 
you and I are, there you go. I'm learning about language and, and English and, and syntax. Grammar, uh, yeah, yeah. But, and grammar. But the most important thing is getting the message out there. And I'll just use this quick analogy with you. And then I do want you to um, uh, uh, go into more depth as to how to tap into these, or not just how to tap into the dreams of children, but how to get children to dream. And then we might go off a little bit into the esoteric, the more metaphysical aspects as well. But we lay out, every time I do one of these programs, a giant table. It almost looks like Thanksgiving. It's a smorgasbord. And we're adding your nutrients, if you will, your nutritional contributions, mental, emotional, spiritual, uh, and physical, uh, to the table. And we ask people to come. And if it resonates with them, please partake. If it doesn't, don't touch it. We don't want you to try something that really makes you feel uncomfortable unless you like taking that challenge. But then take that away, enjoy it, fill yourself up with it, but come back to the table. Because yeah, now yeah. that you have partaken of this plate of food and tried these different seasonings and spices and flavors, come back and try something else. Maybe there's something else that will appeal to your palate and just keep coming back. So that's what we try to do. And, and as, as I also say on this program, we're looking for those new ways of living. And it looks like to me, um, you are pursuing one of those and that is pursuing the, the concept of getting children to dream but also tapping into those dreams that will help us move forward as a society, as a civilization, as a race of people, not of color, but of human beings. Let's talk about, if we can, how you start to foster in children the dreaming, and especially within those children whom you've already described, who, yeah, from yeah. our perspective, have no options other than the generational options of the entitlement programs that their parents, their grandparents may have used. It's all they know, and that's no fault of their own, okay? It's just that they've never been shown other choices. Well, and also the, one of the frustrating things, Richard, is that children are born dreamers, and they're born mm -hmm. geniuses. And we either support and encourage that or we don't. It's not like, it's not like, it's, it's sort of a natural development in, in children. Okay. It's hard to find a kid that's able to talk, you know, from three or four years, well, say at least from four years of age, who you can't say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And if they say a fireman or whatever they're going to say, uh, my youngest grandson says he wants to be an astronaut, he's four. Um, they, you have to beat that out of them to, uh, I don't mean physically beat that out. You, you have right. to crush the natural tendency to dream in order to stop it. So, which is why I ended up in that, uh, that examining room in a remote part of Brooklyn and in front of a foster care center with this 10 year old child who still was able to say he wanted to be a paleontologist. And another kid I met was in the book who, uh, in, the, in the waiting room of a clinic in the South Bronx, who said uh, she wanted to be a marine biologist and then proceeded to give me a lecture about different species of sharks and what differentiates them. These are mind-blowing experiences. And, uh, you know, you think of, oh, my God, can LaToya here actually become a marine biologist? I, you know, I'm not sure. And by the way, they're also born with inherent intellectual capacity that sometimes the traditional school knocks out of them. And this is what I was thinking about when you were talking about music is, a, is a, an incredible teacher, multidisciplinary, really uh, covering everything from English and writing to mathematics and engineering, uh, all true. Um, and children, if you give them the opportunity, if they are getting, if they get permission to manifest their actual intellect that they were born with and the ability to dream that they were born with will surprise us with miraculous outcomes of their childhood, which otherwise would be stilted, compressed, and uh, having the options just torn away from them. So I think there's a lot of compelling things to think about here. 
Uh, but I think we should understand that we're starting off with an understanding that these are, you know, God-given inherent realities uh, of children, dreaming and thinking. Mm. You know, it is true that you hear this quite often from parents to children, whether they be single digit age or in their teens, when they say, I want to be, and it's of a, I guess you'd call it under the category of liberal arts, um, I want to be. And the parents say, there's no money in that. Yeah. Are you kidding me? No, no, no. I want you to be a doctor, a lawyer, a scientist, uh, an engineer, uh, architect, et cetera, et cetera, because there's where the money is. One of the greatest public service announcements I saw on television probably 20 or 30 years ago, uh, and it was a little, it, it well, is probably still around, a little sexist, okay, but I think the point is clear to what you are talking about, what we are talking about. The first scene is of a kid. He's with his uh, playmates. They're rolling their Tonka trucks around in the dirt and playing in the dirt. It dissolves to the next scene of an adult male wearing a hard hat, holding a set of blueprints, talking with a guy, pointing to the blueprints, and behind him you've got a construction site going where they're putting up a building. Next scene, a little girl with her doll, and she happens to have some small little medical equipment, like a little toy stethoscope and so forth. Yeah. And she's caring for her dolly. Dissolved to an adult female working in the ER, caring for patients. Yeah. And what that said to me more loudly and clearly than anything else I have ever seen or heard was children need to be allowed to follow through on the things they did as children when they become adults, because that's what they love doing. Now, um, there was a certain element of that in my childhood in terms of doing these interviews and working in broadcasting. Yeah, but I also yeah. live in a space where I love getting my hands dirty in the dirt, uh, tending the yard, cutting the weeds. So literally uh, speaking. Fire. Speaking. What's that? Literally working. Literally. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chopping wood, making firewood, creating fires, camping, and all of those Fantastic. different things that I, yeah. I am doing. Yeah. And so I am one of the fortunate ones. I like to consider myself one who has been in the right place at the right time who is living his life and doing the kind of work that my father said to me, and I consider him a very wise man, 89 years old this year. Um, please do something that you love doing as far as a job is concerned, uh, because you're going to be doing it for a long time. Don't get stuck like me. Now, my father was only stuck for a period of time. He went back to college. He got his computer programming degree back in the 70s when they had fan fold paper and punch cards. And he was able to uh, move his career forward in other areas before his uh, retirement. Well, that's and, great. Actually. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's to me, that's how we know what a child should be or could be doing with the rest of their lives, you know, and again, it's not the question of, okay, he's out there playing uh, in, with his Tonka trucks in the dirt. Hey, he should be an architect or a designer or a builder. No, well, maybe, but what else does he like doing? And again, now we go into those dreams. When you talk to people who, uh, let me back that up. When you talk to children, okay, do, are there particular questions that you have asked them in terms of helping you to understand where they are coming from, maybe not the specific dreams, but the dreaming concept, because everything starts with a thought or the imagination. Can yes. you talk to us about that? Sure. Uh, and I, uh, first of all, I, I love just asking, this is also kind of a cliched question. What do you want to be when you grow up? And it's fascinating to me to hear what uh, children say. Um, and I'm, not only they say something, I want to be whatever it is, a fireman, or I want to be a doctor or a teacher or work in construction. A lot of that's influenced by what their family does and people that they know are doing and all that's, all that's fine. But how they talk about it is also very interesting, Richard. It's like, you know, um, 
And what you don't want to do is try to say, no, that's not a good thing to do. You want to do such and such. Or I was watching you, uh, you know, work on your letters and learning how to read. Maybe you should be a teacher. No, you, all you want to do at that point is just listen and say, that's a great idea. And maybe you'll do that. Maybe you'll find something else that you like. But just encouraging the process of dreaming is a really, uh, is a really important thing to do. The other thing is I did uh, for about two years, a, a personal experiment in New York City, which has, you know, a significant population of homeless adults on the street. And I spent uh, some time asking people on the streets, first of all, help them with whatever they needed. Uh, I say this, when you were 10 or 12 years old, this is, I'd say this to a 50 year old man or woman sitting on the, on, a, on the sidewalk up against the building, when you were 10 or 12 years old, do you remember what you wanted to be when you grew up? And what happened to distract you from that pathway? And I've gotten some incredible answers. So this is looking at it from the other end. Mm -hmm. People, they wanted to be, you know, everything from a, a professional football player to a teacher, social worker, sometimes a sanitation worker, because they, you know, they had an uncle or somebody who, who did that and was quite happy and successful. And then what were the barriers? Well, I got into drugs or I couldn't afford to go to college or I, whatever it might be, there's, you know, it's a fascinating gold mine of information when you look at it retrospectively uh, mm -hmm. for the, what specifically are the barriers that have kept people from uh, realizing their dreams. And you could look at it from either from the child's situation upwards or forward or from an adult situation who has not made it backwards. Yeah. And you rarely see that kind of uh, sorrowful situation with, uh, with an adult. And if I said to you, well, what, would, what did you want to be when you grew up, when you, when you were uh, uh, a youngster? And you very well might say something along the lines of what you're actually doing, which is really great. Mm -hmm. And when I was that age, uh, if somebody asked, I would have said, well, I had a little chemistry set that you used to be able to get. You know, I don't even know if they have those anymore. And uh, I was thinking, I, oh, maybe I'll, I'll do research about how to cure people. So I had early roots in wanting to become a physician, and that ended up uh, happening. But it, it's a very critical process in the development of an individual and also in fulfilling the promise of society. We want you as a kid, Richard, to do what it is that you feel like you'd like to do, or me, or anybody else. So when you encounter children for whom that kind of dreaming is not actually allowed because it's not going to be possible to fulfill, or they have obvious barriers that will keep them from going to anything beyond maybe a public elementary school and high school, uh, that's a worry for all of us. Yeah. Well, I will tell you that uh, for the longest time, and it was because of the space program in the 60s, that I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to fly. A plane. I wanted to be a pilot for a while also. Actually, okay. I'll tell you more about that, but finish what you're going to say. Yeah. Well, I was born legally blind. I had uh, 2,200 in my right eye, 2,400 in my left. Had lots of surgeries as a kid uh, and um, basically wore thick bottle bottom glasses, Coke bottle bottom glasses, those kind of things. Carried around large print books, listened to uh, books on, uh, on tape and vinyl and so forth. All the way through high school. And... Um, knew that that was pretty unlikely that I would ever become a pilot. Not impossible per se, but I was going to have to wait for technology. Yeah. 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 Um, then when I started uh, my, my work career, I worked very hard to try to get a, um, to try to get a, uh, um, uh, a driver's license just to drive a moped. I only go 25 miles an hour, roughly 30 miles an hour, maybe. So you can't go that fast, but I couldn't get one, not even through the medical review program at that time. Mm. And so at that point, I gave up. I said, you know what? I, I, I shouldn't say I gave up. I changed my perspective and I said, you know what? Okay, they're not going to let me have a driver's license. I'm bicycling everywhere I'm going now and I'm all over the city. And this was in Phoenix, Arizona. You know what? It's not going to be necessarily a bad thing if I'm still pedaling at 65. Okay. And that's actually a good thing because I'll be healthier, you know, and I'll be enjoying because I, I still enjoyed bicycling. I said, you know what? 
let it go. I'm just going to let it go. In 1996, I received a lens implant in my right eye. I am now driving a truck, Ford F-150. We have a tractor, we have a travel trailer. Uh, we've taken on camping trips, which both my wife and I share the driving, driving duties. And I remember the very first time as we were driving from Phoenix to Santa Barbara, where we now live, we are driving through Los Angeles in the late afternoon, actually early evening, uh, twilight. And I am uh, looking around a little bit and I'm going, wow, and this was 2006, 10 years later. I'm actually driving in LA traffic. Wow, this, this is amazing. And I really do try to keep that awe as much as I can, even to this day, now that I'm 60 and I've been driving for uh, 24 years. Um, so the aspect of being a pilot, eh, who knows? Maybe I'll be a pilot when I'm in my 70s. I don't know what the acuity is with corrective lenses. Yeah. But hey, you know, anything is possible. And I think sometimes we get impatient. And maybe I'm wondering about that in terms of the children's dreams and what they would really like to do with their lives. And we really kind of, I'd like to put it in that context, what they would like to do with their lives. Yeah. Because not everybody wants to be a sanitation engineer. Not everybody wants to be whatever the number of categories of possible jobs are out there. Everybody wants to be something different. And so well, you know, one way, so, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say that. So now put yourself, because even with a disability that you were born with, you were able to accomplish so, so much, you know, and the fact that you were driving, probably nobody would have predicted that when you were first born. Not me. Uh, this is not going to happen. And uh, I'm sure the doctors would say that to your parents at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if somebody, if the messages from society are that you are going to be extremely limited in what you can do because of the neighbor you brought up in, because of the fact that you're a black or brown person, because of, you know, you're growing up in poverty in, in the, you know, the Ozarks or whatever it might be. What a horrible thing to hear when you're in a for, your formative years, if you don't, if you don't get permission to think big and dream, whether you have, uh, whether you're abled or disabled, that's a, that's just horrible. It really, I found it heartbreaking. I, I know I should be more clinical about it, but it was, when I, when I got that insight, it's like, I, I went home, I spoke to my wife about that when this light went off and, and I had been working already for 20 years with uh, children who were experiencing adversities, but I was focused on getting them what they needed, getting them medical care, dealing with some of the adversities, but you know, you look face to face in the eyes, uh, look in the eyes of a 10 year old who has so many barriers that, the, you know, it, it's like the, the doctors when you were born telling your parents, he's never going to be able to drive. Well, you prove them wrong. And I would love for these kids, William and Latoya and these other kids I met that I talk about in the book, to be able to look at the entire field of options and tell them, you want it, you can get it. We're not going to allow these artificial barriers of racism or poverty, whatever it is, affect your ability to succeed. And it's not enough to just say that to one person. We have to say that to all children in general, um, which kind of, I'm, I'm reminded of the initial points we we're making about the cliche of, um, you know, children are our future. And we, that, that's not just a, that can't be just a phrase that's spoken idly, which is why I don't use it. And I use let these kids dream and let the adults make sure that they have a pathway to fulfill dreams. That, that's really the essence of the book. Well, I want to throw another perspective and overlay over the obstacles uh, that, and I, I like to use the word challenges that face these kids. Sure. Okay. And that is this overlay that I adopted very early on prior to my career in broadcasting in 1979. And that was that what I had was not a disability. And again, I'm not being PC here by any means, but I took on the, uh, I used the phrase perceived limitation. How would that work 
with these children, the two in particular that you refer to, but obviously a lot of the kids that yeah, you're, talk, sure. you're talking about here, uh, how would that help them from that standpoint? Because my perspective, and now we're going to dive into a little bit into the esoteric aspect of this, the 2020s, the decade of perfect vision going within, um, in terms of a child's imagination, if, if, if their dreams aren't being crushed by society, okay, and even if they are, because we've heard the stories from adults who said, yeah, I know I heard this message and that message, and yeah. look where I am today. They, they didn't let the societal um, barrage keep them down. Yeah. Uh, but kids' imaginations, if, 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 even if they are told this, they really want to do it. They really want to be a sanitation engineer or they really want to be an astronaut, okay? Their imaginations, and again, maybe this goes to the whole aspect of getting some kind of support from some kind of a mentor somewhere. Yeah. Uh, their imaginations will come up with ways to make it happen. Well, it, it sort of depends where you're coming from. So okay. if you live in a, you know, a middle-class environment, uh, you're not a minority, you have parents who are motivated and who will support you, you can very reasonably, you know, dream about uh, getting through school successfully and then going to graduate school or whatever, whatever kind of training you might feel is necessary to pursue the dream that you had. That is one thing. So if you have a limitation or perceived limitation, as you just said, you could say, yeah, I don't care that I, I you know, I may have some visual uh, disabilities now or limitations, but I'm confident that technology will come out and, and medicine that will, will address this. And if it doesn't, I have some other options that I'm going to pursue. That's a different um, relationship and a different narrative than we'd have to tell a child who's grown up in poverty, whose parents grew up in, and grandparents grew up in poverty, and they're stuck in a horrible tenement apartment in the South Bronx or in some rural area of hardcore of poverty and racism like I experienced in the early 70s, um, that's, you have to have a different approach here. You can't just say to a kid like that, oh, you just work hard and be able to do that because the options, the pathways have been blocked mm -hmm. for one reason or another, sometimes intentionally, sometimes because it's always been the way it was. Yeah. And if I say to a ten -year, that 10-year-old kid, William, uh, I say, well, you just go to college, you major in physics, and then you'll get a master's degree and you'll be on your way, uh, you know, a major in biology, you'll be on your way to becoming a paleontologist. That is so impossible. That's so outside the realm of possibility mm -hmm. for many kids that it's kind of a very uh, bad message to give to somebody. You're establishing a sense of hope that actually doesn't really exist. On the other hand, if you're also working to make sure that the barriers for children like that, that we've done enough to eliminate poverty and to create access to advanced education for children, uh, that would be a different thing. You, yes, you can. But mm -hmm. right now, college is unaffordable for yeah. most people. But, and so to say, time, yeah, yeah but if you just but want to, same, yeah, you yeah, can. But, but at the same time, college isn't necessarily for everybody. No, this no, is, I'm just using that as an example. Yeah. Oh, I know, I know, I know. And that's one of the things, too, that I have found so interesting is that everybody is so geared towards university. And, of course, they, they moan and groan about the, the expense. Um, and uh, I think that, the, that I, I, the only college I have had was three semesters of junior college. I made the choice to go to junior college because I wanted to at least start doing something. And at that time I wasn't working in broadcasting. I didn't start till 79. And my first semester in college was, um, I wanna say uh, maybe the uh, winter, January of 1979. And um, I, I took an English class. And this is what was interesting to me about this aspect of choosing higher education in this case yeah. and that was that i made the choice i chose it whereas you go through the first 12 years it's not as much of a choice you know your parents are telling you you're going to school you're going to grade school and high school yeah, yeah. and then you're going to college and uh so i took this english course 
And I remember the first day when they handed out the syllabus and the first thing the instructor said was, and during this semester, you're going to write five essays. I hadn't written an essay in the first 12 years of my first segment of education. I had no clue as to what the protocols were, what the structure was. How you do it, yeah. But by the end of that course, I had written five essays and gotten very high marks on them. And it was a blast because my logical brain took the instruction and said, okay, your essay has to start out with a, a, a sentence. The first sentence or paragraph has to sort of almost summarize what the rest of the essay will be about. Sure. The rest of the essay is details and so yeah. forth. And then you have yes. to have a conclusion. It's just like anything else. You have a beginning, a middle, and the end. And once you start, yep, yep. and the subject matter, of course, that I chose at the time was Star Trek and some of the aspects. What, what was what? what? Star what, Trek. What? Star Trek. Star Trek. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, so um, I made that choice. I decided to do that. Uh, a lot of kids do not have um, uh, do not have the the opportunities, as you said. Sure. But at the same time, there are other opportunities, and I've seen some wonderful uh, movies that were based on true stories. I wish I could remember this one, and I can't remember if it was Tommy Lee Jones who was the mentor. Um, it might have been of this young black kid. It may have been another actor. And I, again, I'm, I'm yeah. blanking on it in, in, in an urban area. Might have even yeah. been of New York. Uh, and of course, when he passed, the kid is now on his own, but the man had left him with such great info as well as some book. Sure. Uh, another book that I read that, that actually uh, brought me to my first wife back in 1982 was called The Greatest Miracle in the World by Og Mandino, the late Og Mandino, who I actually did get a chance to interview back then. And it's, again, it's a story uh, about um, uh, what's referred to as a rag picker. And I'm going to have people get the book uh, to, to find out what a rag picker is. But he taught him some amazing things. There was this letter that he left him that's part of the book that... Like life uh, lessons kind of things? Life lessons, exactly. Yeah. And, and it was just remarkable uh, how, how the turnaround. So this gentleman in the story, he, he got an education in, in, uh, in, so to speak, in how to be more human. It wasn't that he wasn't. It was just that yeah, he got sure. wrapped up in the money-making aspects of everything. Yeah. Now, there is the real, I think, the real disservice that our culture here in America does to its children is focuses only on the money. Now, you made an interesting comment earlier about how, um, you know, the, the people who have found their calling, so to speak, are happy. And that would be the word I would replace success with. Are you happy doing what you're doing? And if you are, then you're successful. Yes, I don't think you could use the word success or successful. I would agree. Without including happy, deeply happy. This is my, mm -hmm. these are the choices I made. I'm doing fine. I'm happy. I have, uh, I wanted to have a family. I have a family. I, I wanted to make X amount of money. I did or came close to whatever. But my life is fulfilled and I feel good about it. You know, I have, uh, you know, uh, we've been living since the pandemic with my daughter, son-in-law, and their four-year-old, our, our, our youngest grandson. Uh, Arthur is a very successful entrepreneur, did not go to college. Maybe he took a, a half a semester or something, or a semester. He did not go to college, and he's done great. My father-in-law, the late my late father-in-law, became an extraordinarily successful manufacturer of, uh, of uh, lighting, indoor lighting and... Um, what do you call that the lights from the skylighting mm -hmm. and became an expert to the point where he was actually asked to testify before a congressional committee. Well, actually it was a state uh, legislative committee in California, in Sacramento. And uh, Jerry never went to college at all. Not a day. Very mm -hmm. happy, very successful. And I think your point is very well taken, Richard, that um, we should not impose our, our personal definitions of success on our children. We should say, you will define success as you get older. 
And hopefully uh, you'll be able to get the tools that you need, whether it's a college education or a technology education or uh, whatever it might be, you know, it, it's, it's this great fulfillment in this world and in life without having to follow a roadmap that's been hand delivered to you with no opportunity to think outside that particular construct that somebody's giving to you. And I think that's a really important lesson. So that's one thing. And then really to make sure that we understand that these kids can't do it alone. The kids that I deal with who are living in poverty or living with uh, racial discrimination and bias. We have to fix some of those problems in order to give kids options, make sure every child is able to be successful in the terms we just talked about it and be contributory to society in whatever the way that makes sense for them. Yeah. Well, I, I want to eliminate those two words from our vocabulary. One of them is success. The other one is failure. Because from my perspective, there is no success or failure. There is only learning and growing. That's yeah. it. Um, and, and of course, I always throw the uh, example of Einstein, uh, Einstein of uh, Edison and the light bulb. You know, and we all know the story. I'm not going to repeat it here, but it's 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 it is worth repeating that that he didn't ever fail because we have incandescent light bulbs throughout this planet that are keeping us uh, lit in the evening and at nighttime and in the early morning when the sun before the sun comes up to allow us to do things. Now we have a, even a newer invention that was dovetailed off of the incandescent bulb, and that's the LED, which yeah. uses less energy. Yes. You know, as, as if the incandescent wasn't, what, what, it wasn't good enough? Okay, well, it's not that it wasn't good enough. It's just that it could be improved upon. And the LED far, was better. It was a step forward, right? So Exactly, especially considering the fact that the incandescent bulb used so much energy to keep it lit. And as good as they've become in terms of their efficiency, the LED lose, uses even less electricity as uh, the, the, uh, the incandescent bulb. And yeah, who knows, yeah. in 30 or 40 or 50 years, we may have a new invention. I'm sure we so, will, in fact, yeah. So, so we just never know. Uh, I, I'm disappointed from the standpoint of uh, uh, the work of Tesla that uh, we don't have um, his technology working for us. You know, free energy, for, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah. I'm hoping that, you know, maybe somebody... <clears throat> we'll tap into the ethers in that respect. I want to go back to the, the more uh, esoteric or spiritual aspects of all of this in terms of, um, have you ever discussed with these children that you um, base the, that, that, that you have um, uh, sort of uh, uh, created this book for and around and, and so forth? And again, I know it's primarily geared towards adults to help them to raise children in such a way as, they, they don't lose their dreams and that they can find the opportunities or, or maybe even the adults who read your book will say, you know what, I, I don't have a lot, but what I do have, I, I could do something. Um, uh, what about, the, there's the phrase that comes to mind in terms of what we've talked about in terms of a children's dreams. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, when society does what it does to a children's dreams, it, it's a, the equivalent of soul crushing and I, that a child doesn't, yeah. doesn't believe in themselves anymore. And yeah. so now yeah. we start creating, we start creating in our society problems. Does that make sense? That, that it we, totally makes sense. You know, yeah. you, it's like the first thing we're saying is that kids have to have permission yeah. to dream and to think about their lives in the fullest extent possible, to grow, to continuously learn, to explore the world, and end up finding themselves fulfilled, which means happy, satisfied, doing something that you feel good about. This is really, these are, these are the benchmarks that we have to aspire to. And it's a question of, do children get that kind of input? This is where we would like to make it possible for you to go, but also to the adults where we're saying, don't take your eye off this prize here, which is making it 
easy. We need a glide path for kids to become, in, in the terms that we're talking about, successful in their lives. It'll be good for a child. It'll be good for you. It'll be good for our society and uh, our planet, actually. So, yeah, we have a lot to think about with this messaging. And I, you know, my, my dream would be to have uh, the adults uh, in our country and in the world understand that one of our primary functions, I don't care what you do for a job to make a living, but you never should take your eyes away from trying to make the world a feasible and glorious place uh, for the children we've brought into the world. So um, that's, that's what I think we need to have is inspiration, permission uh, to say the right things and to feel the right things. And, uh, you know, understanding the reality that what is good for our children is good for our country and for the planet. So, yeah, I can say yeah. would be how I'd conclude that. How would you, uh, we've been talking about children at large, and I did mention the, the concept and you referred to that this is, this is, this is a global problem because we have in this country, the situations that we have, but around the world, We've got conflicts. We've got people running from their homes to other countries because of conflicts that sure. are raging around different places. And, and then we have attitudes on the part of uh, peoples of those countries they're running to saying, no, 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 no. You go back home. Well, we, yeah. we don't want you here because, quote unquote, we don't have the room or whatever the excuse. We don't want you here. You know, and I, I, there's 65 million people in the world right now who are either refugees or displaced persons. Mm. And I actually visited a number of refugee camps for Syrian families in Greece a couple of years ago. And it was startling. These people are basically sitting around in these uh, refugee camps uh, with no understanding what their future is. Because, yeah. the, you know, they were not wanted in Europe. They, they couldn't go back to Syria. And they were in limbo with their children. Yeah. And this was also another one of those experiences, Richard, that I was thinking to myself, what the hell is going to happen here? This is, this is a terrible situation. And nobody's really got any real solutions here. You're not going to send people back to war-torn northern Syria, for example. Yeah. That is a very significant hot zone. You have people, there's a massacre that happened a couple of days ago in Ethiopia where Ethiopians are fighting with Tigrayan uh, rebels and whatever they're fighting about, they're killing people. They're killing children and innocent family families who are just trying to scrape by and do their thing. And they're in the middle of a crossfire between the government and uh, rebel forces here. It's just horrible. And then yeah. people are now fleeing from conflict areas there. Where are they going? Are they going to Sudan? When are they going to come back? What is the future for them? It's yeah. very, very tough. I want to thank you so much, Erwin. Uh, Erwin Redliner, for joining us here on the program and uh, sharing the stories that you have uh, as far as the work that you are doing. And we applaud you for, for coming up, uh, coming to the program, as well as to sharing the future of us, what the dreams of children mean for 21st century America, as well as the 21st century Earth. Uh, website. Where do we send people so they can continue to uh, research this, to find out more, get a copy of your book, maybe connect with you? Yeah. So if they go to uh, my personal website, which is uh, Irwin Redliner, uh, dot org, they'll find the stuff that I've written, the stuff I'm talking about, and ways of uh, getting uh, getting the book. And um, yeah, and I'd love to actually get feedback from people having after they've read it to see what they think and what they might recommend or what their own experiences are. That would be absolutely great. Absolutely. Uh, so it's erwinredliner.org and uh, that's it. It's pretty simple. It's I-R-W-I-N-R-E-D-L-E-N-E-R. -E -E and I really appreciate it. This is a great conversation. The time went really fast. Richard, it and I, it I, did indeed. And if so, I may, uh, I want to ask you three quick questions to wrap this sure, up. Course, and and uh, again, thank you so much for giving us so much time. The first of the three questions that I want to ask you is, who is Erwin Redliner? Wow. 
that's actually not a quick question, but let me <laughs> let me try to respond. Erwin Redliner is a person who has had a variety of really incredible life experiences. And in the book, a lot of those are recounted because it's part of it's a memoir. And I've had, you know, work with Lionel Richie and Paul Simon and Joan Baez and so on and getting a lot of the programs done that I wanted to do. Uh, but at the core, I think I'm a human being, a grandpa, and a person who cares about our world and a person who's really committed to the mission that we've been talking about, which is making it possible for every single child uh, to do well, to be happy, to be fulfilled in life. This is, this is really my essence. And I thank you for asking that. No one's ever asked me that before, but there you go. The second question you may have already answered, but I like to ask it just the same. What is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you're doing now? You know, starting a few years ago, uh, it was actually at the wedding of one of my nieces. I got up and it was all you know, obviously younger people. And I actually apologized to her generation. And I've repeated this in other venues for leaving the world in a mess. You may not agree with that, but I, I'm acutely aware of that as I'm getting into my you know, later years that we didn't accomplish what I thought we would be accomplishing at this point of my life. And th what I'd like to do is be able to do whatever I can to make sure that the coming up generations are going to pick up the mantle, are going to pick up the leadership and really fulfill the dreams that I have had really since my early 20s. So that's, that's what I'm hoping to accomplish. Well, the final question is, what is your life's purpose? These are not easy questions, Richard, but, it, you know, unless you're a complete nihilist and do not care about your place as a human being in the universe, in our society, on the planet, I think we all need to understand that we have a purpose here, whether it's, it's religious-based or comes from your personal inner workings uh, and from your heart, I think that we all have a purpose. My purpose, if I have to decide or have to describe that would be to help make the world better and to help make people understand how important it is that we nurture our children, all of our children, as if each one of them were our own. That's my purpose. Well, Erwin Redliner, I want to thank you so much and encourage people to go to your website, erwinredliner.org. We yep. will be linked to your website so people can get there very easily and quickly and also listen to these podcasts on SoundCloud and the other locations, as well as watch the video on YouTube. And again, thank you so much for giving us so much time. I know you've got another interview to go to. Uh, my apologies. I extend my apologies to the next interviewee, interviewer. No, it was actually, I just have to run a Zoom meeting, but I'm, okay. I'm in charge. So I, I do need to get to All it. Right. But Richard, yeah, I just want to say this was a fantastic uh, hour here. And I really enjoyed the interactions with you. And I uh, hope we uh, hopefully our paths will cross again at some point. Well, I would love to to continue this conversation. Uh, this is extremely important uh, because uh, if we can allow our kids to be kids and allow them to dream while they are young, then uh, when they get older, uh, they will fulfill things that we can't even dream of today. Exactly. Thank you. And I thank you for listening to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to law.